Hey, while you in the first five seconds of the video, go ahead, like and subscribe. Shalom Israel, this is Bishop Nathaniel. I want you to know that you can view all our Sabbath classes live on IUIC TV. That's right, I said on IUIC TV. Download the app today. Shalom. Sex before marriage. Fornication, in other words. Pull up that first article. Go back up to the, the title. The Science of Sex Before Marriage. You can read that. I think that's, I said the second chapter, second one, right? The second paragraph. Yeah, start the second paragraph. Firstly, it's important to appreciate that we are fundamentally hardwired for intimacy. At a basic level, the draw a person feels towards sexual contact is good, regardless if you think of it biologically, psych psychologically, uh, philosophically, socially, or spiritually. Now, there are certain systems in our brain that move us toward mating, like most animals, and there are additional systems in our brains that wire us to connect with one person, together for life, unlike most animals. The data demonstrates this in multiple ways. So we want to pull from this. It says there are certain systems in our brain that move us toward mating, like most animals, and there are additional systems in our brains that wire us to connect with one person together for life. One person together for life. That's what, that's what we have to instill for you single brother, single sister. That's what you got to keep your mind on. You're repenting. One person for, together for life, meaning when you get married. And this is what we have to instill in our young daughters. We, this is what we got to instill in our young men. That those, because it says, uh, what's the, the, it says, at a basic level, the draw a person feels towards sexual contact is good regardless of if you think it's biologic, if, if you think it biologically, psychologically, philosophically, socially, or spiritually. So basically, as our, as our, as, as, as our young men and our young daughters of Sarah, as they get older, they go through puberty, they're naturally going to have a, a, a desire towards, towards the opposite sex. But it's our job as the parents to teach them to not have premarital sex, to teach them how to curb that desire so that they don't fall, like our sisters, our young sisters, so they don't fall into that trap of getting defiled our young men, so they don't be hunting after the young women and trying to defile them because they're trying to fulfill that lust. It's our job as parents to teach our children that. We have to teach that to our children so they know how to, um, how to curb that appetite, for lack of better terms, because it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. We can't be naive and be like, oh, that's not going to happen. That's my, she, she's, still, she's still my little angel. Oh, he's my little prince. No, we have to be realistic and understand because we was that we was all that age at one point in time. You know, when you, when you, when the young men start going through puberty, those things are gonna those those desires, those feelings are gonna come. But they have to they have to be taught how to curb that until they get married. And that's our job as the parent. We are supposed to teach our children those things. We supposed to we supposed to expose expose them to those things so that we can guide them and teach them so when they do get so they don't get exposed to it outside of us outside of us telling them about it and then they get exposed the wrong way and then they end up falling uh falling um victim to having premarital sex and then they bring shame to our house and things of that nature we have to make sure we teaching them guys our responsibility as a parent get that in um tobit Tobit chapter, the book of Tobit, chapter 8 and verse 7. And now, O Lord, I take not this my sister for lust, but uprightly, 
Therefore, mercifully ordained that we may become aged together. So this is our job to teach our children this. That they don't they don't take a sister or a sister don't allow herself to be taken by a young man for lust because they attracted to each other. No, we have to teach our children. No, that's not that's going to destroy your life. That's going to destroy. That's going to cause us for the young sisters. It's going to cause you great emotional damage. Even if even if it's a case of it happens and you end up um, you end up. You, you, you end up marrying that brother. It's still going to cause emotional damage because it was done the wrong way. That's a, that's a judgment. It was done the wrong way, so it's going to be a level of emotional damage that occurs because it wasn't done right. Anything that's not done right from the beginning is going to be trouble. It's going to be trouble. Go uh, pull that article back up. Yeah, more, more happens. More happens during sex than just a momentary experience of pleasure. When we are intimate, chemicals are released in our brains that bond us together. So it says, when we are intimate, chemicals are released in our brains that bond us together. Read. Vasopressin is primarily released in male brains and oxytocin primarily in females. However, when we bond, then break, Bond, then break. We damage our capacity to bond strongly to the next person. And this is the this is the bad, this is the bad example that many of us was taught before we learned the truth. And we fell susceptible to this. So us as adults, we came into this, we came into this this truth. We had little, we had younger children, and as we've been in the truth for years, our children getting older. So it's our responsibility because we experienced this. A lot of us, we experienced this. Bond, then break, then bond, then break. We damaged, we damaged, we, we, we damaged because we actually did those things. So now knowing that we're supposed to be able to, we, we have to use that experience to be able to guide our children so they don't go down that same pathway. They don't go down that, that same um, emotional roller coaster that we went through. Uh, get that in Genesis 2, 2 and 24 because it said, it, did we finish reading that paragraph? We finish reading that paragraph first. It's similar to how sticky a piece of tape is. The first time you apply it to a surface, it bonds strongly. But if you take it off and apply it to another surface, it's less as adhesive. Soon, it's barely sticky at all. And that's what happens when you, ha when, when you have sex before marriage, especially if it's sex after sex, sex after the sex with this person, then sex with that person. Many of us, before the truth, we experience those things. Because we know it about those things, we have to educate our children so that they don't fall down that, 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 that same pathway of heartache. Because we know that's what it is. It's heartache. It causes emotional damage. Of course, most more so on our sisters. But it also, it, it also causes emotional damage on men. We, we like to put it on a bookshelf and act like ain't nothing happened. But it call it causes the same effect on men. It's just not as extreme because men we men we are not as emotional. But it causes a, a damage. Read that in Genesis two and twenty four. The book of Genesis chapter two and verse twenty four. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they shall be one flesh. That's that bond that that article is talking about. They shall be one flesh from the beginning. It's, man, it's a man and his wife, not a man and his wives, a man and his girlfriends, a sister and her multiple mates. No, that's not what it's, it says. A man and his wife. That's one wife. And like Tobit said, that's aged together forever. That's your, it's supposed to be one sex partner, and that's it for life. That's your wife, and that's it. Your husband, that's it. It's not supposed to be multiple because that causes emotional damage. Uh, read on in that article. Go back to the, pull that article back up. Researchers found that those who wait to have sex into marriage compared to those who don't report significantly higher uh, relationship satisfaction, 20%. Better communication patterns, 12%. Less consideration of divorce, 22%. And better sexual quality, 15%. 
These effects are lessened, but still consistent in those who became sexually active later in dating, but prior to marriage. And then you keep the article on the screen, but these are things that, though it may be uncomfortable, because this your daughter, this your son, it may be uncomfortable, but these things, they have to hear it from us. You don't want, to, you don't want them to hear it from the TikTok video, from the Instagram video, from the uh, Facebook, the Twitter. You don't want them to hear it from that. You want, to hear, hear, want them to hear it from you because you're going to be able to communicate, communicate it to them and actually educate, it on, educate them on it and direct them in the right direction. Now, if you've done your job and they still go off and be wicked, you've done your job. But you can't, you can't avoid your job because it's uncomfortable. You don't want to face the reality that your, your daughter, your son is getting older. They they gonna go through puberty. They gonna they gonna be 19, 20. They're gonna they gonna have to you're gonna have to give them up in marriage one day. If that if if the Lord's will, if that's the Lord's will. But you can't be naive and be like, oh this my this gonna be my little princess forever. No. Nah, she's she's gonna she's gonna grow up. Your son is gonna grow up. We gotta have those conversations. It, 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 uncomfortable or not, we gotta have those conversations. That's our job. That's our duty to our children, to be able to guide them in the right direction. Uh, read on. So the idea that practice makes perfect regarding sexual intimacy happens to be backwards, unless it's all with the same person you're married to. Likewise, sex while dating can sometimes be thought of as an important way, as an important way to test if a couple are compatible and whether the relationship can stand the test of time. Another assumption that appears disproven by the data, in summary, the longer so you... So it, it, notice the article, and this article is saying, it's saying exactly what we read out the Bible. It says that, that that assumption is disproven by the data, meaning it's not, uh, it's, it's not important, it's not good to text it, test it out to see if you're compatible before you get married. That's out of order, that's out of line, that's not biblical. And these things we have to teach our children, Read. In summary, the longer a dating couple waits to have sex, the better their relationship is after marriage. And that, that it's like that because, like, like I said in Tobit, because it's not, it's not based off of lust. If it's based off of lust, it's going to be a rocky road. Not saying that it's going to be forever rocky. It can improve with repentance, with the scriptures, but it's why, why even go down that road when you don't have to? Why even go that when you have the scriptures, you have the you know the right way to do it. You know that you know the right way to do it. You can direct your children in that right way. Why even set them up to go down that that wrong way and damage and and break and have a broken broke have broken emotions and now they have to fix those broken emotions to be able to have a healthy marriage. Read on. Another study found that rapid sexual involvement has adverse long-term implications for relationship quality. The researchers' analysts, analysts also suggest that delaying sexual involvement is associated with higher relationship quality across several dimensions. That's why the scriptures say, let every man have his, let's get that, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Is it seven, seven, one? Seven and two. Read that. You want me to start from one? Or? Uh, start at one. The book of First Corinthians, chapter seven and verse one. Now concerning the things whereof he wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Even this here, you we have to we have to teach our young men this. We have to teach our young daughters this because when they teenagers, like they're gonna have that, they're gonna have that inclination towards the opposite opposite sex. But we gotta show them it's not good. For you to, it's not good for you to touch a woman. You don't even know what you don't know what it means to be a man. You you you're not ready for that step. Yeah, you have the desires, but now is the stage of you learning how to curb that. So when you do get of age to be able to have a wife, to have a husband, it's not based on lust. You learned how to subdue that desire. Well, when you do get to that point where you get married, you're able to it's it's in righteousness. You you able to move forward righteously according to the commandments, according to the scriptures. Read. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication. And it says, nevertheless, to avoid fornication. That don't mean go and take the sister because you lusting. 
get married because you you full of you inflamed with lust. No, it still means get yourself together, get your mind right, battle, get get um get a hold on that lustful spirit. And then, because the scriptures don't contradict itself, you still you still your goal, your aim, your mindset shouldn't be, I'm getting married because I'm burning. Because you, because when you get married, you still, you still gonna have the, that that lust is not just gonna disappear because you got married. You have to learn how to control that spirit. Because what are you gonna do when the, the, when the, the Leviticus fifteen sisters have a sister go get on a cycle? You can't have sex. What you gonna do then if you ain't if you ain't learn how to control that lustful spirit? You ain't controlled that lustful spirit. You gonna mess around and do something you ain't got no business doing. Read on. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let's see, let every man have his own wife, and every woman have her own husband. That's how it was designed from the beginning. We supposed to have one wife and 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 one 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 one, one husband, one wife. You got something off of there? Yeah, also, uh, all praise to the Most High. You're hitting it right on the head. Um, the scriptures have the answer for whenever there's lust, whenever that lust is arising in our bodies and our minds and our spirit. And the scriptures have the answer for it. Also, just eloquently just explain how you don't want to marry a brother or sister just because you're burning. So here's... And just to uh, add on to what the officer is saying, here is a scripture to help you if you are battling this. Give me Romans chapter 6, verse 12. Romans chapter 6 and verse 12. The book of Romans chapter 6 and verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. So when the Bible says let not, this is not a suggestion. This is a commandment. Read it again. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. So that means you have to meditate therein day and night. You have to fast. You have to keep yourself busy in this truth. You have to have accountability partners in this truth. If you're a brother, then you should have accountability partners uh, in this truth. Call your brothers up. Call leadership. Call the soldiers. Call the officers of 10. Call the officers of 20. The sisters. Call the senior sisters. Because they done been through it already. Read it again. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye, should, that, you sh that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Read it again. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. So let not sin have control or power therefore in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Because that's all it is, is lust. And one thing that I learned, because I was single for a long time in this truth, one thing that I learned is when you are having that, that lust battling in your mind, the best thing for you to do is get in the scriptures. The best thing for you to do is call your brothers. Because if you don't do that, you start entertaining it, you're not applying the scripture right here. Next thing you know, you start that lust starts to graduate. It's like a cancer. If you don't treat it, next thing you know, you're going to fall. That's all, officer. Excellent point. Uh, go from there. Go to uh, 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 3. The book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 3. For this is the will of God. So it says, for this is the will of God. What's the will of God, brothers? One of the brothers, uh, brother Abishai. The mic, say it on the mic. Psalms 40. And what the, what song, what is it? What's the, what, what is the will of God? That we keep his commandments. That we keep his commandments. So it says, this is the will of God. Read. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye shall abstain from fornication. So it's the will of God that we abstain from fornication. So if this is the will of God and we say that we are in the truth, we're supposed to be teaching our children these things. We have to teach our children these things. And if you're single, 
you have to maintain this thing in your in your in your in a, in a you have to maintain this in your mind. And even you marry, you have to maintain this in your mind because the temptations are gonna come. Whether you single or you marry, temptations are gonna come. You have to you have to warn, you have to know your own spirit. And if you battle, if you battle a lustful spirit, you have to subdue that spirit. Because otherwise, if you don't and you entertain it, you're going to fall. It ain't no you might or you may. You're going to if you entertain that sin. You're going to fall. So you have to make sure that you, it says, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye abstain from fornication. You cannot make provisions for your flesh. And we have to, us as parents, we have to show our children as they, be, as they get into that age bracket where they, they start going through puberty, we have to show them how, we have to make sure we show them how to abstain from fornication. We have to hold them to labor, keep them busy. Don't give them over much liberty so that they, they, they free to do, be exposed to all these various uh, levels of wickedness that's out here in this, in this uh, world. Read. Verse 4, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. So we are supposed to make it our duty to know. We, we, you, had, you know yourself. You know what you battle with. So it's our duty to make sure that we, um, that we possess our vessel in sanctification and honor. We have to, you battle lust, you need to be studying the scriptures on lust. You need to study the scriptures on lust. And when that, that like the officer brought out, that, that, that demon try to rise up, you got to get in the scripts. You also, another avenue, like he also mentioned, make a phone call. You have to make a phone call. It's a battle. It's a battle in your, in your mind. Because when that lust, it's a war. So when that lust come up, it, it, it's, it's a thought that, it, it, like when, 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 the, when, it come, when, the, when it comes to a case of, a brother falling into fornication, adultery, whatever you want to, whatever you say, it started in his mind. That lust came, it came up, and because he didn't fight it off with the scriptures or go call a brother like, hey, man, that, 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 that lustful spirit kind of trying to come up on me, and now you're on the phone with the brother, you're on the phone with a sister, and she's able to talk you through it and that, that desire go away. That's the, the scriptures say the most high make a way of escape. There's many ways of escape, but you have to know yourself. When that lustful, you have to, you have to, uh, when that, when that way of escape, that door uh, shows itself in your mind. Because if anybody, before you commit any act of sin, we talking about fornication now, but any level of sin, your battle is being a thief. If your battle is being, a, 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 if, you, if you was a murderer, you have hatred in your heart. The avenue, every, any time before you commit that sin, the scripture come in your mind. The scriptures pop in your mind. If you've been studying, you know the scriptures, the scriptures pop in your mind. That's your way of escape. But if you ignore it, you're going to fall into sin and you're going to fall into judgment. That's why the, that's why the scriptures say, for this is the, that's why I say that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. And sanctification, understanding that. The Most High chose us. You, you've, been, you've, been, you've been blessed. The Most High didn't put you to death when you was doing the wickedness that you was doing in the world. And now you hear, you understand that the Most High cleansed me of that evil. He, he, he showed mercy on me. And I got to honor him by possessing my vessel, learning how to subdue my body and subdue my lust, not allow myself to fall into those lusts. Read. Verse 5. Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. And that we, we separate ourselves from that lust of concupiscence, that evil sexual desire that many of us know, to, know knew, knew, I'm going to say knew. Many of us knew well before we came into the truth. Many brothers and sisters going to the club, doing all type of whoredoms, doing all type of wickedness. And you knowing that, and even, even, even you may say, oh, no, I wasn't, doing, I wasn't out there like that. You know what goes on. And it's our responsibility because we know what goes on in the world. And for many of us, what was going on when we was teenagers, now it's a whole nother beast out there. 
it's like 20 times worse than what it was when we was in the, when we was younger. And I'm still young. I'm I'm a very young man. But when we were, it, that was you know what I'm about five years ago. That was about five years ago when I was a young man. No, I was, <laughs> but seriously, we know we know what was we know what was going on in that lifestyle. Whether you was living that lifestyle or not, you had friends. If you wasn't doing it yourself, your friends was doing it, and you knew that you knew that lifestyle. So you knowing it, you have children. And it, it don't start when it don't, it's, it's, it's not supposed to start when they become, when they start going through puberty. You should have already been teaching them, teaching them certain things, teaching them certain things. You still kind of have, you may still have some type of a, 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 a guy, what's the word, what's the word I'm looking for? You still, you have to know how to filter it properly, depending on their age. But you still should have been cultivating the, the the discipline in them as they growing up. And even if, if you haven't, it ain't too late. If you haven't, it's not too late. Because many, many people, many uh brothers and sisters come into the truth and they come into the truth and their children is already teenagers. It's the starting point is now. You can still save them out of that fire. You can still save them out of that 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 emotional turmoil. Go back to pull that article back up. You got to bring it home. Bring the article back up. I think you had so why is this or so why is this? Why might sexual restraint be more beneficial for couples than premarital sex? The evidence appears to point to two reasons: intentional partner selection and sexual symbolism. Proper partner selection becomes difficult when you receive the strong and immediate chemical. See bonding above. Emotional and relational benefits of sexual intercourse. Those rewards cause a person to overlook and deny deeper possible incompatibility. The relationship. So that's the damage that it could do. Keep the article. That's the that's the damages that could happen because a lot of times with premarital sex, ain't no you don't know you don't it ain't a like we and we like we brought out yesterday the all in the Bible times and I when we were back in our right mind and we was doing things right, the father chose his wife's, you know, no, the father chose his daughter's husband. And that was done properly and carefully because the father, like we, like we read, we're going to read it today, like we read in Sirach 42. The father, it says, the, let's get it right now, since I don't want to misquote it. Sirach 42 and 9. The book of Sirach, chapter 42 and verse 9. The father waketh for the daughter when no man knoweth, and the care for her taketh away sleep. Because the father's, the father's mentality is, I want to protect my daughter. That's, that's from harm, from being defiled. The father's thought process towards his daughter is, I want to protect my daughter. So we gonna, anything that happened, and, and, and this, ain't, this, 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 this is a brief story. They don't they ain't got nothing to do with it fornication but this is a brief story of the and this is this is a brief funny story of the 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 lengths that a father would go to protect his daughter um and this is a funny story about me so my oldest daughter Salome when she was first born um uh, I think we we had her in our own crib at like six months so she was in the next room sleeping and we had one of the little baby monitor things and my rib used to sleep with it and the volume used to be loud as hell. So I was asleep, and I was a hard sleeper until I had children. So I was asleep, and I heard a <coughs> and I was asleep. So in my mind, I heard <coughs> and I jumped up, and I was in the room in like two seconds. It almost felt like I didn't touch the floor. It's gliding against the wall. But <laughs> I tell him what, I, I was in there within a blink of an eye, and I come back in the room, my Maria was laughing me to scorn, because why you, she like, why you jump up so fast? I'm like, she was choking. She was like, nah, she just coughed a little bit. I was like, nah, she was choking. But I say that that's, that's, how, a fa that's, that's, how, a, that's how a father is towards his, not just his daughter, towards his children, period. Anytime some type of danger pops up, and, it, and it's for a father, the father is, you just better get out the way. 
That's, that's pretty much what it is. That's what the scripture is saying. The father waketh for the daughter when no man knoweth. Read. When she is young, lest she pass away the flower of her age, and being married, lest she should be hated. Uh-huh. And he, 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 he does that because he want to protect he want to protect his he want to protect his daughter from that from going through that emotional distress going from that that emotional drama when it is as it relates to fornication because the father already know if a, if if a man do that prior to marriage and all let that man have hatred for her. he's going to destroy he's going to destroy her he's going to destroy her spirit because that's a that's a with, with women that's that's a uh, and I think one of these if it's not this one one of the articles with women that's a, a that's a more it's it's more of an emotional attachment when when once that the, with this with sex women women are more emotionally attached with it so and if, if that man if she get defiled and that man like nah I'm going I'm gone that's emotional damage that many of our sisters have been through being in the world. And us being in this truth, we don't want that for our daughters. We don't want that for no sister. So that is that's that's it's that important for us to make sure that we are training up our daughters. And even the sisters that may come in, and we we have a lot of sisters that come in that are single mothers that don't that may not have that. The scriptures say, "Be as a father." We have to make sure we setting up things to where we still have that um, that avenue for the sisters that that come in that got teenagers that they may not have a father. That's our responsibility as the men. Um, read on. In her virginity, lest she should be defiled and gotten with child in her father's house, and having an husband, lest she should misbehave herself. And when she is married, lest she should be barren. Don't no father want to hear that his daughter was defiled in his house and then was pregnant. Don't no father want to hear that. That's that's heartbreaking for a father is. Like all this, like damn, all this, all that I've been doing to try to protect my daughter from this, and she, she slipped under my nose. That's that's don't no father want to experience that. Don't no father want to see that. That's why in verse 9 it says, the father waketh for the daughter when no man knoweth. That's why we have to make sure that we have we can't have our daughters having the liberty. We can't have our sons having that liberty. We have to, they have to be, um, it was, it's, it's weird, it was a, it's a definition. One of the officers just brought a definition up with definition of liberty. It says, um, let me see if I can pull the definition up. Uh, pull up, go look up def, the liberty real quick. Let me finish that verse while you pull it up. Verse 10 again? Uh, yeah. Verse 10, in her virginity. Lest she should be defiled and gotten with child in her father's house, and having an husband, lest she should misbehave herself. And when she is married, lest she should be barren. Meaning the, the father want to make sure that his daughter is well prepared. So when she does get married, she bring she brings um joy to his ears because what he the, the report he hears, this what he sees within her marriage, he sees that she's a good wife. She sees he sees that she's bringing him a good name because she's not going and, and being a nigga in the marriage. Go ahead. Um, and that's the beauty of us being in this truth because, you know, we've been through it all as adults. We've done seen a lot. We've done been through a lot. Now here in our repentance, we get a chance to reform our minds according to God's mind and keeping these laws. So now that we have children, we have a, a teenage daughters, teenage sons. We get the have the opportunity to give them something that we didn't have as we're learning in this truth. So as the officer was pointing out, um, once you started, you once you are having a sure watch over your daughter, you have to realize that you don't want to give her that wrong impression or that bad advice. So now she has that mindset where, you know what, it's okay for me to uh, have these lustful thoughts. So you have to always keep these laws in the forefront of our mind. Like as it says in Deuteronomy, what is it, uh, chapter 4, or chapter 6, 6 and 7. Every time when you wake up in the morning, you talk these laws to your daughter or your son. Uh, during the day, at night, talk these scriptures over. 
It, it never gets old. Because if you don't, you're going to prostitute thy daughter. And that's another way of prostituting thy daughter, by being absent in the house, even though you're there. Because you could be present in the house, but still be absent. So we have to be sure that as men, we have to make sure that we are not being absent in the house, even though that we are there with our children. Same thing, sisters. Don't be absent in the house, even though you are there. Uh, read verse 10 again. Verse 10, in her virginity, lest she should be defiled and gotten with child in her father's house. And having an husband, lest she should misbehave herself. And when she is married, lest she should be barren. Uh-huh. Read on. Keep a sure watch over a shameless daughter, lest she, sh lest she make thee a laughing stock to thine enemies, and a byword in the city, and a reproach among the people, and make the... Thee is shamed before the multitude. So it says, keep a sure watch over a shameless daughter. So this, in this context, it says, keep a sure watch over a shameless daughter. But nevertheless, we have to keep a sure watch over all our daughters, whether they, whether they shameless or not, because we have to make sure that they don't get bamboozled into some foolishness. It's our job to make sure that. So whether they shameless, this, the scripture specifically says shameless, but we have to keep a sure watch so that... It, they may be that deceitful, you might not see it. You should, because you know, you know you should know your children. But if, especially, you have a sure watch over your daughter, especially if she's shameless. But even if she's not shameless, you're still supposed to have a sure watch over her. Pull up that definition real quick. Liberty. The state of being free within society from oppression. Restrictions imposed by authority of one's way of life behavior, or political views. So looking at this definition, you know that this definition been t changed over time because just the, def the def this definition, this is, this is an evil definition because it's in the reason I say it, it says the state of being free within society from oppressive restrictions imposed by authority. As a parent, you are the authority over your child. It's not oppression. If I tell my, no, you can't have a phone. That's not oppression. That's me protecting my daughter from being exposed to the wickedness of this world. That's not oppression. But they would, this, and this is, what they, this is what they put out there because they got all these weird laws now where a child can go and get, uh, go to the doctor and the parent can be put out the room because they ask the, they ask the child, oh, do, are you, do you want your child, do you want your father in the room with you? And the child say, no, you got to get out. What type of stuff is that? But that's what this is. That's why they changed this definition. That's evil. To try to put it, that, that's that witchcraft that Esau, that Esau craftily puts out there. He put words in there like that to make it seem like it's bad for a parent to have restrictions on their child. Right. They, they, that's, that's evil. But we have to make sure, it's our, that's why it's our responsibility to make sure we constantly teaching our children so they don't get uh, swayed by this type of stuff. Because that's, that's something subtle. If you, if you ain't really pay attention to it, you'll read over that and be like, oh, that's a good definition of liberty. But it's actually not. It's, 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 it's very subtle. It's subtly uh, what's the, deceptive. That's like a toxymoron, ain't it? Ain't that an oxymoron? It's the same word. I ain't no English, man. That's not the same. Okay. <laughs> but but, th but that's what it is. It's a subtle deception. It says, the state of being free within society from oppressive restrictions imposed by authority on one's way of life, behavior, and political views. It's supposed to have some level of authority over you. But otherwise, you're going to do whatever the heck you want and get away with it and think it's cool. That's the problem. That's why in this truth, we're supposed to be transformed by the renewal of our mind. Test, test. The Bible tells us that the mother and the, and the father or the parents, in other words, have authority over the children yep. in the book of Sirach. So that goes to show you how much the world is in opposition to the Bible or to the words of God. Yep. You go ahead. Uh, uh, let me get uh, 2 Ezra 5 and verse 52. 
to go further with what the officer was bringing out concerning having a sure watch over our daughters, right? So as parents, right, we all remember how, how hard it was for us when we was young, we was middle schoolers or we was teenagers, and, you know, we had our social life, and we wanted to fit in, and we had peer pressure, and the type of uh, lusts or desires that um, we battled during those times, how hard it was for us, right? Watch this. Read um, 2 Ezra 5 and verse 52. The book of 2 Ezra chapter 5 and verse 52. Say unto her, Wherefore are not thou, are not they whom thou hast now brought forth like those that are that there were before? So he says, it's given a, 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 a similar to the parable. Not a parable, but a similar to. He says, Say not thou, are not those that were brought forth first, like those that were, I mean, that was brought forth latter as those that were brought forth before, meaning first. Read on. But less of stature. Go ahead. And she shall answer thee, they that be born in the strength of, of youth are of one fashion. So let's say you're a 25, 26, 27-year-old sister, right? Um, and you're married and you have children. The children that you bear, they are of one fashion. They are born in the strength of your woof, your youth. All right, come on. And they that are born in the time of age, when the womb felleth, are otherwise. So, and they, and let's say you had children that was 27, they're one, one stature, but then you reach maybe 43, and then you begin to have children during that time, and you more aged, and your womb fell if those children are of another stature, typically a lesser stature people, right? Come on. Consider thou therefore also how that ye are less of stature than those that were before you. Uh-huh. And so are they that come after you. Less, so, go ahead. Less than ye. So we got to remember the things, we're naturally stronger in spirit than our children, just like our, our parents were stronger than us in spirit than we are. So if we, th if we know that it, the, how hard it was for us to battle fornication or battle peer pressure uh, in our youth, we must know, according to the scriptures, that our children are going to battle those same things. But yet in this world, those things are magnified. And they're less in stature than us. So they're going to get a more heavy dosage or more pressure or feel more pressure than we have done. So we can't be ignorant of that knowledge. But with that, let me get uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 20. Oh, yes, hold on, Mark. The book of 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 20. Brethren, be not children in understanding. Uh -huh. How be it? And malice be ye children. Now, from there, I want to ask Brother Eleazar, why do you think Paul said that? Shalom, shalom. Uh, could you repeat the question, officer? It says, brethren, be not children in understanding, how be it in malice be ye children. But in understanding, be men. Why do you think Paul worded this statement the way he did? So he worded the statement the way he did because uh, as children, as young men and women, we don't have the same mindset as when we get older. As we grow in age, we become more, uh, we become more wise. Okay, good, good. That's right. And what I want y'all, what I want to point out is that typical sins that we battle, they're really youthful lusts. Like malice, that's why I said, but in malice ye be children. Children typically move in a spirit of malice. They're always prone to jealousy. They're always prone to, uh, uh, what, they want to commit fornication or whatnot. Their, their flesh is in its full strength. So what I want to show y'all is that fornication, sin is a very youthful um, desire, so to speak. Like when we get older in age, the uh the the lust for uh sex kind of winds down a little bit more. You know, you don't wake up with a with a with a hard rod, or you're not always having wet dreams so forth, uh, as often as you did was you, when you was in your youth. Those things wind down with age. So sin or malice or fornication, those are youthful lusts, those are youthful desires. Our children are battling those things in its full strength, right? 
And we know that spiritually they are of a lesser stature than us. So we can't be ignorant of that. And for you children, 2 Timothy 2 and 22. And then that'll be it. The book of 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 22. Come on. Flee also youthful lust. Flee what? Flee also youthful lust. Come on. But follow righteousness, uh -huh. faith, charity, peace. With them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. You see that? Sin is a youthful lust. Fornication is a youthful lust. Why do you think it's of the young, uh, the younger generation where murder is very prevalent or, or baby mamas is more prevalent? Fornication is more prevalent because it's youthful lust. Vanity. You want all the finer clothes. You want all the finer women. You want to live your best life. You only live once. These are all young thought processes. Sin is a youthful lust. Y'all got to understand, y'all don't want to, you don't really, you're going to destroy yourselves if you fall into your flesh because what you're feeling right now is just a temporary feeling. You're going to make lifelong decisions for a temporary feeling and you're going to destroy yourself. And that's what you teenagers don't understand. And that's what we're trying to convey to you. That's what God is trying to convey to you. That's why he says flee youthful lust. But for those that don't want to flee youthful lust, Ecclesiastes 11 and 9. This is the flip side for that. Because some of you may just be setting your ways, right? And you think that we don't know what we're talking about. The Bible don't know what we're talking about. We're a bunch of crazy church people. Some people may feel like that. Well, this is what, this is what our forefather Solomon said. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 11 and verse 9. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth. So go ahead. Rejoice, in your young man or young woman, in your youth. Go ahead. Do what you want to do. Rejoice. Live your best life. YOLO. You only live once. Go ahead. And let thy heart. Cheer thee in the days of thy youth. Uh-huh. Do whatever your heart desire, whatever your flesh wants it to do. If you're feeling horny, go ahead. Have sex. If you want to get high, go ahead. Get high. Go ahead. And walk in the ways of thine heart. Go ahead. And in the sight of thine eyes. Go ahead. But know thou but that. Know, but know this. If you choose to go down that path. Come on. But know thou that for all these things. God will bring thee into judgment. God is going to judge you in your last days. When you think you're getting away with it and you're having all your pleasures, well, you know, I'm young, I'm dumb. I don't know no better. I can't, it's cool. I'm young and dumb. The society is okay with it. I'm going to fix it in the end, and eventually I'll come back to God. But right now, I just, I just don't feel like it's right for me right now. Solomon said, go ahead, go ahead, do that if that's what you want to do. But remember, God is going to judge you for all your works. He's going to keep it in remembrance. Remember, it's evil, sin, what does it say? Wickedness is bound in man because judgment is, uh, what is that, Ecclesiastes uh, 8 and 11? I, I don't want to get it because I don't want to take too much time, but it says evil is uh, bound in men because judgment is postponed. It goes somewhere along those lines. It's, or it's not uh, speedily executed. Right. But read on. Verse 10, therefore, remove sorrow from thine heart. And put away evil from thy flesh. So what is he saying? It's better to just to remove the sorrow from your heart and the evil from your flesh because you will be judged and your past is going to follow you. You hear it all the time of us aged men like, man, I wish I ain't did that. I wish I did better in school. I wish I wasn't so naive. I wish I would have listened to my parents. I wish I would have listened to Miss big bro. I, man, my life would be so much better. You hear adults say that all the time. All the time, but no, it never clicks in our head. Damn, I, I should probably listen to this person. Yeah. Read on. For childhood and youth are vanity. It is what? Our vanity. Childhood and youth is vanity. It grows old. You get over it. But guess what? When you're in your older age, you still got to live with those decisions that you made. Now you 35, 36, and you a felon. Can't get a job. Now you want to go to school, but you can't get accepted. Okay? Now you want to get married, but you got a, a, a STD. Don't nobody want to marry nobody with an STD. You have to live with the choices that you made in your past that you was warned about while you was in your youth. So go ahead, live. Do what you want to do. But remember, you will be judged. That's it. 
still got time. Let's bring that article back up. Bring that last article up so we finish finish that article. I want to try to get through these articles. Most of us have experienced the honeymoon phase of a relationship. We see the other with rose-colored glasses, which makes it difficult to see them with an honest perspective. Early sex creates a sort of counterfeit intimacy that makes two people think they are closer to each other than they really are. That's why the leadership set, set it in place that the proving process proved for at least a year. That's why we've seen over the course of years, we've seen the many classes that leadership had to do because of backdoor marriages. A, a backdoor marriage turned south. Well, it was turned south when it was a backdoor marriage because it was done wrong. They 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 put the the uh what is it called? What is it called the the cradle before the the horse before the cradle? That that's how it go. The horse before the carriage. They put the horse before the carriage. See, I told y'all I'm young. I don't even know that know the right saying. But read on. Sexual symbolism. Anyone who engages in regular sex with the same person will tell you that most of their relationship involves hanging out with friends, rearranging the furniture, going to the movies, cooking dinner, etc. Cert sure, sex is happening, but statistically, occupy yes, but statistically occupies very little of your time, even if it's happening every day. If the only thing that draws you to the person is sex, then you don't have an actual relationship, and certainly not one able to survive the test of time. For example, real-life problems. So that lets that lets you know, sex. A lot of a lot of brothers and sisters got it very twisted. Sex does not equal marriage. Sex consummates the marriage when you when you've done it right. Sex don't equal marriage. You 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 put you you choose to have sex before marriage. You're gonna destroy yourself and the other person. That's what's gonna happen. In the BHI, they say um. What they say, uh, sex e equals marriage, right? Black Hebrew Israelites. I believe so. They um tell us that sex equals marriage, and when you examine their life, it'd be just crazy because they got like four or five different wives living all in different apartments. It's just, it's just, it's terrible. Right, and that's what that's what you want to keep yourself from. Uh, that was the end of that article. Or is it more on that article? If that was the end of that article, pull that next one up. Pull up that next one. The one, let me see. Should be the focus, the first the focus on the family. The risk factors for yeah, that one. Let's read through this real quick. Focus on the family. Risk factors for teen premarital sex. Are we starting from the top? Uh, yeah, you're starting from the top on this one. How can I know if my teen is likely to engage in premarital sex? My spouse and I have tried to raise our kids in the right way, but we're, neat, but we're keenly aware of the culture is, culture is working against us. Promiscuity is fashionable nowadays, and sexual temptations are everywhere. How can we guard against it? Are there any particular risks? Uh, factors we should watch out for as we try to guide our teenager through this challenging phase of growing up. One of those ways, like we just like we've been reading, is don't give your children over much liberty. Keep them to labor. Keep them busy. Keep your eyes on them. If you if you can if you can uh, if you can um, if you're able to try to homeschool your children. So they're not exposed to that public school system. Because that public school system is wicked. It's evil. And it's going to put all type of crap into your children's head. They're going to be exposed to all type of evils that is going to be hard to, it's going to be hard to um, come back because they got all that, you got all that. They, they in the school, what, seven, eight hours a day, Monday through Friday. And then you got to try to undo all of that stuff that they've seen. And then they going into the school, they the only one with fringes. They the sisters, the only one with a dress with fringes. The brothers, the only one in the school with fringes on their shirt. So they're gonna be the, the, the they're gonna be the um the 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 butt of the jokes because they the only one that's standing out. And I I think they, they like the officer was bringing out, they're not of the same stature. 
they're not going to be able to handle that. It's good. So too much of it, they're going to break. They're going to break. So we have to make sure if, if you're able to homeschool your children. Uh, read on. Let's begin with a few general observations. In this area, as in so many others, a teen's attitudes and behavior are largely determined by family relationships and the quality of his life at home. On the whole, teenagers who feel incompetent and adequate. Incomplete, I think, I think, I think, I think so. Oh, the Vanessa needs some glasses. <laughs> we got we to make it bigger. <laughs> who feel incomplete, inadequate, and unappreciated are more likely to seek comfort in sexual relationships. That's because they're desperately looking for the love they haven't been able to find anywhere else. And that's, that's what, that's the importance. We, us parents, we play a major role in preventing our children from being victim to premarital sex. We play a major role in that. So, like I said, if if you if you have if you if you if you haven't been doing it, you have to start. You have to invest that time in your children. You have to invest the time. You can't be always working, always busy, always doing this, always doing that, and you neglecting your children because what they're gonna do. And we've we've most of us have been victim to it. We've done it. Most of us grew up where we didn't have our father in the house. Our mother was always gone. Something was wrong. And what we do. We ran to the streets because we ran, we ran to the streets and did what we was doing because we was looking to fill that void. We was looking for that, that love, so to say. But and we, we know because we've been through, ain't no love out there in them streets, especially now. It's way worse now. So we have to make sure that we be making them adjustments and making sure that we spending that time so our children don't fall into this category. Read on. On the other hand, those with a life in rich, relationship, rich in relationships, family traditions, activities, interests, and most importantly, consistent love and affirmation will probably be less inclined to embark on a reckless search for a fulfillment that might involve unwise sexual decisions. Marie? And those who have a vibrant, heartfelt faith in God are in the best position of all. Committed believers are most likely to have deeply rooted, well-thought-out reasons to respect and preserve the gift of sex and to avoid the temptation of exploit others, I mean to exploit others for selfish ends. So we we have and we have the words of eternal life. We have the true understanding. This is a, a Christian article that's saying this. But we know we have the true understanding of the Bible. We uh, we have we have the greatest gift in this world. So we have to make sure we we doing that uh imparting that to our children so that they don't fall victim and susceptible to that. And like I said, like we 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 read through history. We read through history. We know the history of the Bible. Where it's in, in some cases, in some cases, you could you could be doing all of that. And if your child is wicked, your child gonna be wicked. You got to be able to at some point. You got to be able. You gonna have to make a decision. But you have to make sure you're doing your part because on Judgment Day, the Most High is going. If you wasn't doing what you were supposed to do, and your child ended up going off. And going into the world, and it was on account of you because you wasn't doing what you were supposed to do, you're going to be judged for it. But if you was doing everything in your power and doing what you were supposed to do to teach and guide your children so that they don't fall trapped to this, and then they end up all, oh, I'm wrong, I'm going to go do this. You're trying to, you're, trying to, you're trying to oppress me. Your blood, your hands are clean because you did what you're supposed to do. You did what you were supposed to do, so your, the guilt is off of your hands. The blood ain't on you. It's going to be on them. They're going to have to give, uh, give account for their own actions because they decided to go against what they was being taught. Go ahead. Test, test. Yeah, so let me uh, back you up with that because what the officer has said is extremely important. Um, give me that in Proverbs 22 and 6. The book because, of Proverbs. Because um, just so y'all can hear it out of the scriptures, what's commanded to y'all in this situation when it comes to a parent and child. Let's see what the Bible says about how we as parents must deal with our children. Read. The book of Proverbs, chapter 22 and verse 6. Uh -huh. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Mm -hmm. Keep Verse 7. That was it on that? Yeah, Read it again. Six. Train up a child in the way he should go. So this is a commandment, parents. This is our duty as parents. So like the officer was going over, if we don't do this, do our due diligence in training up our children, then yeah, we will. Um, when judgment day come, we we gotta stand. We gotta stand for that. Um, 
Right, we got to stand for that judgment because we didn't do our part. But if we do our part, then our hands is clean, like it says in Ezekiel chapter 3. Was that it on that, Vanessa? No, sir. Read it again. Train up a child in the way he should go. So what are we to train up our children in? Uh, Torah, stand up. We should, we should, we should uh, train up our kids in the commandments. Right. We should train up our children in the commandments of God. And the only way we're going to be able to train them up properly, if our faith is up there, if we actually believe in this walk, if we actually doing the things that God has commanded of us, then we can actually train our children up properly. But if brothers, if, if y'all faith ain't there, sisters, if y'all faith ain't there, build it up. Because one thing that we, like, like, like we were stating earlier, us adults coming into this truth, we didn't have this understanding that in our youth. So I hate to put it like this, but we kind of like got the best of both worlds because we understand how it is to be in the world. Now here it is, we understand how it is to be in this truth. So it should be that much more of, we should be much more creative when it comes down to teaching the laws to our daughters and to our sons. Give me Titus chapter three, verse three, because in training up our children in the way they should go so they won't fall or waver, but they'll be able to run back to it, it's that much easier because we understand the dangers that is up out there. They don't understand what's really going on out there in that world, but we understand that. Read at Titus 3 and verse 3. The book of Titus, chapter 3 and verse 3. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish. Because we was foolish living out there in the world. Because foolish, when you read Psalms 14, 14 and 1, I believe, it says that the foolish says that there is no God. We was in the world living like there was no God. We was we didn't have any consciousness of of judgment for the behaviors that we was displaying out there in that earth. Right. We didn't have no fear of any type of judgment that the most high would bring on us. It was we was void of that. Read it again. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish. And what would we do? Read. Disobedient. We was disobedient. So with us understanding how we will act as disobedient, you can see when your child is going off. You understand your child because you know their spirit. You've seen them from their youth since they were little babies. So now as they're growing up as teenagers, you understand when they're doing things, when they're not. You know when they're, um, when they're lying, when they're telling the truth. You know all of those things because you know their mannerisms. Read on. Deceived. Deceived. Serving diverse lusts. So we understood that we were disobedient, we were deceived, and serving diverse lusts. So it should be that much more that our understanding of teaching these laws, it should be that much. We, we should be more so um, having more of a, of a game plan to make sure that our children don't fall off into that. Because we understand exactly what they're going through. Because we did the exact same thing when we was in the world. Like I said, we kind of sort of got the, I hate to put it like that, the best of both worlds, but we understood how to live wickedly. Now in this righteousness, so we should be that much creative in building a sanctuary for them so that they won't fall into these things. Read on. Serving diverse lusts uh -huh. and pleasures. Mm -hmm. Living in malice and envy. Hateful and hating one another. Hating and hating one another. Because when, when, you, when you are getting, when you, when you fall into fornication or when you fall into adultery, that is hatred. You hate your spouse and you hate the person that you're committing this act with. And that's a very dangerous thing that we don't want to make sure that we don't want to fall into that. And we also don't want our children to fall into it as well. So we have to be creative in making, a, uh, making that environment more fun, making the truth more fun for our children so they won't fall into these things. That's all, officer. All right, those ex excellent points y'all brought out. Um, because it's... This is this a very it's 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 a often overlooked, even though it's one of the most important things. It's one of the things that's most prevalent. That's the this every every uh over the last year, the classes that we've been getting from leadership, majority of them has been about fornication because there's that's that's been that's been plaguing the nation of Israel. Fornication, fornication, fornication. Because that's that's what that's what Esau got set up. 
That's what's in the that's what's in the media. That's what's on the commercials. I don't even know if it's still on the commercial. I don't watch TV. But that's what's all out. That's all that's out there. Everything is over sexualized. And us knowing that we have to make sure that we are putting up the right safeguards for our children. Pull up that um that PDF. Can you see that? Sir. Uh health impact of premarital sexual behavior among adolescents. Study reflects that different culture and religion do not give permission to have premarital sex. Along with this, our society, growth, and development of mind towards premarital sex was not acceptable. Study also reflects that most of people agree with premarital sex is a bad habit. Moreover, premarital sexual behavior among adolescents have direct and indirect impact on health like unwanted pregnancy, teen age pregnancy, abortion, STI, HIV AIDS, regrets, guilt, loss of self-respect, depression, loss of family support, substance abuse, depression, loss of self-esteem, and suicidal death. Get Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4. All of those things that we just read, all of those side effects, so to say, of premarital sex is right here in Hebrews 13 and 4. The book, of, he the book of Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4. Marriage is honorable in all. So marriage is honorable in all. When a, when, a, when a man is able to give his daughter off to a righteous man, a man of understanding and marriage, that's righteous. That's what, that's what the Most High is talking about. That's a righteous marriage. Or a sister and a brother got their self right first for at least a year. And then when they did prove, they proved for at least a year, and then they got married. That's righteous. That's honorable before God. That's an honorable marriage. Anything else otherwise, backdoor, underhand, all of that is evil before the Most High. Read. And the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. So it says, whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. That judgment is what? Pull that article back up. It says God will judge whoremongers and adulterers. That's premarital sex. Go back up. Their health. Health like unwanted pregnancy, teenage pregnancy, abortion, STI, HIV, AIDS, regrets, guilt, loss of respect. I mean, loss of self-respect, depression, loss of family support, substance abuse, depression. Loss of self-esteem and suicidal death. All of those things are that's the that's the God will judge the adulterer and the adult and, the, and the, the whoremongers and adulterers. That's the judgment. A unwanted pregnancy, teenage pregnancy. All those things are unnatural and not what's designed by the Most High God. Abortion. Abortion affects the would a, 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 an abortion would affect a woman's body. Negatively, because that's not what that's not when you had that's not that's not that's not natural. A STI, what's the what's the what this stand for? I forget. STI, sexual transmitted sexual infection. infection. A HIV AIDS regrets. That's a that's a judgment. That's a damage in your spirit. Guilt, loss of self respect, depression. Loss of family support. Now your family want to put you out. Your family want to get rid of you because you, didn't, you got defiled in the, in the father's house. Substance abuse, depression, loss of self-esteem, suicidal death. All of those are the judgments of God. That's what's going to happen. That's why you're supposed to wait until you get married. You wanted to say something? Yeah, I was going to say, not only do uh, abortions affect the woman's body, um, what was the word you used? Affected uh, negatively. It's effective negatively, but um, abortion and also, what is the other thing they got the pills? Um, uh, uh, what is it called? Plan B pills and the other ones to prevent marriage. Uh, um, Birth control. Those control, also yeah. affect uh, women's bodies uh, negatively as well. So I just wanted to put that out there. Uh, pull the article back up. Go down, you go down. So these are the these are the results of the studies that they uh 
they took. Let's read through these real quick. 93% of respondents posited that engaging in premarital sex can lead to HIV and STIs. Of the 10 studies that measured impact on STD rates, two found positive impacts, six found no significant impact, and two found negative impact. Abortion. 53.8% of respondents managed the problem of unwanted pregnancy by surgical abortion, and other 46.2% managed by medical abortion using medicine. Depression, regret, and low self-esteem. Premarital cohabitation is associated with higher levels of depression and lower levels of self-esteem, as well as lower life satisfaction. 68% stated that premarital sex consequences of depression... Wait, so it says premarital, premarital cohabitation is associated with higher levels of depression and lower levels of self-esteem as well as lower life satisfaction. That's your... Uh, that video that the leadership always play of the brother from Chicago... To beat the doonies down, and and you in there, that's what that is. You your brother posted up, that's premarital co cohabitation. That that it, it's associated with higher levels of depression and lowest levels of self esteem. This is one. This is one of the things you see when you see a, some of y'all may have had friends growing up, made new women that was in abusive relationships, where the brother was beating the crap out of them. And the woman would go right back to him every time because he said, oh, I'm sorry. I love you. That's because she had low self-esteem. She was depressed. So he was, it was easy for him to just come back and say that because she was depressed. That's the, those, are the, the, those are all the things that, that are caused by premarital sex. Read on. 68% stated that premarital sex consequences of depression are after having sex. So 68%. 68% stated that premarital consequences of depression. That mean that 68% of the people that they tested, I think it was six, the, the number was 280 out of 286 people, 68% is the depression is one of the side effects. Read. 43% stated that premarital sex consequences of regret after having sex. 38% stated that premarital sex consequences of guilt feeling after having sex. Is that it on there? That was, that's all I had highlighted? Pull up that last article. I think it is. Pull up that last one. The uh, Catholic education. Hey, y'all. So you know what that consists of? What, bishop, what leadership always talk about, especially the bishops? Post-nut clarity. They fulfill their lust, yeah. and then after the lust is gone, they enter back into consciousness, they get conscious again and be like, damn, why I do that stupid stuff? Yep. And then they looking at him like, man, who the hell? Yep. What the hell am I That's in bed exactly with? It this loser, do I don't even like him like that. Yep. Why did I even do that? Now yep. I'm defiled. Now I got, you know, I don't, don't want to get too graphic, but sisters, they wind up like, man, just for, sometimes people make a dumb decision, they do it just for the experience. They be like, oh, it wasn't all of that, and I just defiled myself. That's all it was? Yeah. It's post-nut clarity. That's why they fall into depression, and they don't have that same self-esteem. And guess what? They try to find another another place to exercise the, the desire or the fulfillment that they was looking for, right? That means you, Satan, Satan got in your mind. Was you was you was just being led by Satan? Did everything, and then soon you, it sounded good. Everything was smooth. Everything sounded good. As soon as you did it, Satan was like, "Whoop, I'm gone." And then you came back to your senses like, whoa, just happened. That's what that is. You was possessed by a demon. And once that demon got you to do what he wanted you to do, he left. And now you're looking stupid. After he done exposed you and shamed you, he gone. Now you're like, dang, I ain't, I, how did I end up here? Now you hide and trying to act like you're still a virgin. Exactly. We'll pull up that next one. The neglected heart, the emotional dangers of premature sexual involvement. So and, just, yeah, read that. We're going to read these first little quotes. I lost my virginity when I was 15. My boyfriend and I thought we loved each other. But once we began having sex, it completely destroyed any love we had. I felt he was no longer interested in spending time with me. He was interested in spending time with my body. Amanda, a college student. 
that's why the proven process is important. That's why it has to be done the right way. Because sex is not all marriage. M marriage ain't just sex. Like I think in the other article, it says a small percentage of your time is spent having sex. The rest of the time is that relationship building. All of the every, everything else is more important. And sex is sex is like the sex is the consummation, and everything else has to be involved. But if it's just sex, you're gonna be destroyed. If it's just based off sex. You're gonna be destroyed, and it's not gonna last long. It's gonna be a, it's gonna be a, 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 a turbulent roller coaster. Read the next one. I wish someone had been preaching abstinence in my ear when I was in high school. That was when my sexual activity started. I don't even want to think about my college years. I wish I had saved this for my for my wife. These are all regrets. Read. Mike, a 26-year-old husband. There is no condom for the heart. There is no condom for the heart. Once your heart is broken, you ain't no repairing that. It's, it's a hard recovery from that. Uh, go down. So this, these are 10 emotional dangers. And just for time's sake, we're not going to read through those because this, this article is very long. So just the 10 emotional dangers, we're just going to read the bullet points. Any emotional dangers. Number one, worry about pregnancy and disease. You had you have sex before marriage, you're worried about getting pregnant, and you're worried about disease. That's stress. That causes stress, unnecessary stress at a young age. Now you're having heart problems. Now you have all these ailments with your body because you did something that you weren't supposed to do. Next one. Two, regret and self recrimination Recrimination. 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 So you regret. You, you, you live in, now your life is you're living in regret. Man, why I do that? You're beating yourself up. That leads to more depression. Self-recrimination. Because you know what you did was wrong. And, and most of us that came into the truth later, and we, we did those, we knew though, we knew what we was doing was wrong. But we was doing it, why? Because that's what everybody else was doing. That's what the older... The old adulterers that Dota was doing. How many girlfriends you got? I know you got about six of them. Let me smell your fingers. That's, that's, you that's what nothing. was promoted to us. That's all we were taught. But we knew it was wrong. Even they knew it was wrong. But that's all that was pushed. And then it resulted in these things. Read. Three. Guilt. Then you see that, that, that wasn't, a, it wasn't a bullet point, but abortion. Four, loss of self-esteem and self-respect. You, lo you lose all your, you lose self-esteem. Now you, you, you done lowered your, you done lowered your standards. You done lowered your standards. Because like I said, even before this truth, we knew right from wrong. We knew, we knew right from wrong. Because to some capacity, a lot of our grandmothers, mothers, they was actually trying, they was tr doing, they was doing the best they could with what they knew. But they didn't have a commandment. But they was doing the best that they could with what they knew. They tried to instill some things into us, but because they wasn't doing them a lot, on most cases, they was telling us one thing and doing another, and we seen that, and we just followed what we saw them do. We didn't follow but everything they said that didn't line up with their actions went in one end, right out the other, because we was, we was watching, we was observing their behavior, and that's what we followed. Uh, back to the article. Number five, the corruption of character. The corruption of character. Now you're labeled, you, 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 you get defiled, now you're labeled as a whore, a whoremonger. Your, your reputation is scarred. Read. Number six, shaking trust. You, you, don't, you, you have no trust. Your trust is broken, especially, especially in the case of somebody sex you up and then they gone. You ain't gonna trust nobody else. No, it's gonna be very hard to rebuild that trust. You are now. You are a broken spirit. You are a broken soul. That's what happened to many of us before the truth. You are a broken spirit, and it take a lot to repair that. Read number seven: depression and suicide. Depression and suicide. Sometimes it gets to the extreme of suicide. Read eight: damaged or ruined relationships. That's that's what the these are all the results of 
premarital sex. These are all the things that could happen from premarital sex. Read. Nine, stunted personal development. Your personal development is stunted because you had sex too early. You engaged in an adult activity that should be between a husband and a wife, and you done it too early. Now your personal development is stunted because now you're bonded with somebody that you shouldn't be bonded with. And it's detrimental because you bonded with somebody and now that somebody is gone and you, it's, not, it's not your husband, it's not your wife. That bond is broken. So now your personal development is stunted. That's, a, that's, that's judgment. That's the judgment that Hebrews 13 and 4 talking about. Read. That's it? Number 10. One more. Number 10. Negative effects on marriage. Negative effects on marriage. That's what we've been seeing in the, with the various classes that has come out over the years. Backdoor marriages. You see crazy stuff happening because you didn't you didn't lay down with somebody that you don't know, and now because you uh, I think one movie call it uh, one of the movies one of them Tyler Perry movies where they had the the husbands they took they twenty for they 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 replaced they eighty for twenty. That's what it is. is that what it is? One of them, I forgot what movie. It's one of them Tyler Perry movies. So, but it say the the eighty the eighty percent is their wife, and they done stepped out on their wife, and for twenty percent, and then after they did it, it's hell, because now they lost they they lost their wife, and now the twenty percent gone too. So they now they just stuck. That's what that's pretty much what is what that's talking about. Also, because you stepped. Until you had sex premaritably, right? Or premarital, I don't know the right word, but if you had sex before marriage and nine times out of ten, you probably did it multiple times, and now you've been accustomed to different shapes and sizes of a penis, then now you get married, and this person that you're married to, his ride ain't like the ones that you had before. So now you can't enjoy the sex with your own husband. That's how not that's what that's going into a dysfunctional marriage, what it was saying right there, because you had sex before marriage. So now you want the sex with your husband to even better or as good at least as the things that you had before. You so now you see in the world what, what what women are saying now when before they get with a man. Does size matter? Absolutely, yeah. Why would it matter if you only had one? You know that only one, and that's the one that's fit for you, and it pleases you. But because you've had multiple others, now you need to get that fixed. And when you get with the one that you know that's right for you and he ain't right, so you got women out here saying good guys is not good enough if his rod ain't, ain't big enough. That's a real thing. They would rather take a bigger rod than a good guy. Why? Because of sex before marriage. That's why. So now you're going to have a name of being a neighborhood hoe, pretty much. Yeah. Hey, and that's why the Bible stresses, um, that's why the Bible stress so much about the daughter, having to watch over the daughter, about making sure your daughter is intact rightly, watch over her, things of that nature, it stress the daughter because of that, uh, just because of the example that the officer just gave, because a man, he, he although it's wrong for him to do it, but he can go, you know what I'm saying, and do it, and, and he ain't got to worry about those things, but like he was just bringing out, that was an uh, excellent point, and that's why the Bible stress about having a, a watch over your daughter so strongly. All right, pull it, pull that article. I think it's a little bit more on that article. Ten rewards of waiting. You want me to read the? Uh, it's important too. Yeah, you can read that. All of that. It's important to know about the emotional dangers of premature sex, but it's equally important to be able to identify the benefits of saving sex for a truly committed love relationship. Here are ten rewards of waiting. One, waiting will make your relationship better because you'll spend more time getting to know each other. Two, waiting will increase your self-respect. Three, waiting will gain you respect for having the courage of your convictions. Waiting, number four, waiting will teach you to respect other people. You won't tempt or pressure them. Number five, waiting takes the pressure off you. Six, Waiting means a clear, concise, no guilt, conscience. and peace of mind. A clear conscience. A clear conscience, no guilt, and peace of mind, no conflicts, no regrets. Number seven, waiting will help you find the right mate 
Someone who values you for the person you are. Number eight, waiting means a better sexual relationship in marriage. Free of comparisons and that's based what, that's, on that's trust. That's what you just brought out. Read that again. Number eight, waiting means a better sexual relationship in marriage. Free of comparisons and based on trust. There's not supposed to be a comparison. It's not supposed to be, let me try it before I buy it. No. That, that's, that's all worldly, and we, we have to instill these things in our children. Read. By waiting, you're being faithful to your spouse even before you meet him or her. Number nine, by practicing the virtues of, involved in waiting, such as faithfulness, good judgment, self-control, modesty, and genuine respect for self and others, you are developing the kind of character that will make you a good marriage partner. Number 10. By becoming a person of character yourself, you'll be to, able to attract a person of character, the kind of person you would like to marry and to have as the father or mother of your children. So, that, that's going to conclude the class. Um, like I said, huh? You got something? Go ahead. Uh, one last thing. Let me give Wisdom of Solomon chapter 4, verse 1. So, Sisters, sisters, especially you teenage daughters, right? You teenage sisters, be mindful, be mindful. I know the stuff seems very fun. I know the stuff seems very pleasurable, right? But you don't know what you're getting into. You don't know what you don't know. I'm going to show you something. Uh, well, God is going to show you something. Wisdom of Solomon chapter 4, verse 1. Wisdom of Solomon chapter 4, and verse 1. Better, is it, better it is to have no children... And to have virtue Read for the again. better it is to have no children. Now, notice it says better it is to have no children. We have to learn to read between the lines. Remember, when in order to have children, it has to come from a household through marriage. So what is also really saying it is it's better to be single and not married and have no children and have virtue. Read. And to have virtue, for the memorial thereof is immortal. The memorial thereof, or your reputation will be immortal. You will have a good name. Come on. Because it is known with God and with men. It's going to be known with God and with men. So it's better to be single and without children and have a good reputation. And that's going to live with you even after you die with God and men. Read on. When it is present. Even while you live. Come on. Men take example at it. Men and women are going to look at your example, and they're going to admire it. They're going to honor it. Come on. And when it is gone. And when you die, read. They desire it. They're going to want to look, be, be just like you. Come on. It weareth a crown. Uh-huh. And triumpheth forever. Go ahead. Having gotten the victory, striving for undefiled rewards. Striving for undefiled rewards. We all are striving to get the kingdom of heaven. Come on. But the multiplying brood of the ungodly shall not thrive. But the, un the multiplying brood of the ungodly, meaning children that are born out of wedlock before marital status, they shall not last. Come on. Nor take deep rooting from bastard slips. They're not going to take, you're not going to take good root. Come on. Nor lay any fast foundation. Come on. For though they flourish in branches for a time. Although you're going to have children, you're going to flourish in branches for a time. It's going to appear that way. Come on. Yet standing not fast. You're not going to stand fast at all. Okay, come on. They shall be shaken with the wind. Read. And through the force of winds, they shall be rooted out. You're going to get rooted out. You're going to have a bad name. You're going to be known as the neighborhood hoe. You're going to be despised among society. Everybody's going to want to try to get a piece of you, and they're not going to respect you. And guess what? That's going to build your low self-esteem. And you're going to be like, well, shoot, I might as well get with this one. We might as well get. I might as well shake what my mama gave me. I got to make it work somehow. You're going to be shaking with the wind. You're going to destroy yourself. It's better to just don't get married and be single and have virtue than to be known as a neighborhood hoe. Come on. Verse 5. The imperfect branches shall be broken off. Uh-huh. Their fruit unprofitable. Your children will be unprofitable. Come on. Not ripe to eat. Uh-huh. Yay. Meat for nothing. Good for nothing. That's what God is saying. You're going to be good for nothing. When you have premarital sex, your value decreases. 
I know y'all teenagers be on TikTok. I know y'all teenagers be on social media. What's the main thing they say? What's your body count? Because you decrease in value. If your body count is high, I don't want it. I might hit, but that's it. You understand? You're going to be meat for nothing. Don't destroy yourself. That's it. No, nah, read on, read on. Verse 6. For children begotten of unlawful beds uh -huh. are witnesses of wickedness against their parents in their trial. Because everybody going to be saying, where the baby daddy at? Why didn't you marry that father? I ain't taking care of that kid. That your wickedness, that child is going to be a witness to your evil because you didn't know how to keep your, your legs closed. That's what it is. So it's better to be have virtue and be single or wait for marriage than to defile yourself. And then now you have to bear that shame because you're the one that's going to have to deal with that child if that man decides to walk away. You're the one that's going to be left with it. You're the one that's going to hold that responsibility. So don't be stupid. Follow the scriptures. Follow the counsel that your parents give you. Follow the instruction that's been given to you. Be wise. Okay, take an example of your four parents, all right, and make the right decision. That's it. All right, so that concludes the class. Pray y'all are edified. Most high in Christ, bless. What is nation? Nation is family. Nation is community. Nation is men leading by example. Nation is women's support. Nation is children with role models. Nation is unity. Nation is you. It's nation time.